I just want to make sure. There we go. I just want to make sure, if you don't mind, um, how's my sound? Is the sound okay? Can you hear me well? Is everything clear? Feel free to give me a thumbs up on Zoom. And you can unmute. And I'd love to see some cameras, okay? We haven't started yet, full force. So feel free to turn on your cameras. Thank you so much for the thumbs up. You guys are lovely. Uh, it would be really lovely to see some of your uh, beautiful faces this day and kind of get more uh, familiar uh, with everybody. Ya ahla, ya ahla, hello, hello. Doreen, lovely to see your face. Rima, your beautiful smile. So lovely to see you all. Joel, welcome. Uh, Emmanuel, welcome. Madhav, welcome. I hope I'm pronouncing your names properly. Soham, of course, a member of CTA. Um, Jackie, welcome. Venzo, uh, Sherry Han, welcome. Mr. Joseph, welcome. Mr. Sanjay, welcome. Sarah, welcome. Lynn, Claudia, Asha, Joel, Rania, Rindala. Uh, Manish, welcome. So hello, everybody. It's really lovely to have you connected with us today. All right. I think um, as we continue to move forward, there's going to be some individuals who are joining, but I think we've got a, a nice, beautiful group to start off with. So let's start off with this question, if you don't mind. Can I ask you if you've taken any training on emotional intelligence? And if you have, you can raise a thumbs up, you can unmute, you can type on the chat. There's like literally many, many different ways, a variety of ways to let me know and let us know. Okay, so I see Rima and Joseph have taken emotional intelligence. All right, anybody else? Cool, we are live, being streamed live on Facebook. So for those who are watching us on Facebook, also welcome to this cast today of Transformational Tuesdays on a Wednesday because of me, because I had to, unfortunately. But we're going to talk about, and just to, to, to synchronize with everybody, about the emotional impact uh, of the emotional brain, limbic brain on coaching and how coaching can vis-a-vis -vis impact the emotional or limbic system. And I think this is really, really important. So I see uh, Doreen and Lynn have also responded that they've taken training on emotional intelligence. And so I'm really curious, if you don't mind, at this stage to kind of ask you, um, as you took training with emotional intelligence, if you followed up with coaching or if coaching came first, did you feel at any point in time or did you recognize or was there any link that was done at a neurological level and at a sensory level for you when it came to the context of emotions in coaching? What would you say the relationship is between emotions and coaching? And if you'd like to answer, please raise your hand. Let's keep the uh, Zoom uh, call organized and I'll be more than happy to pass over the torch for you to have a chit chat. Would anyone like to share? Even if your camera is not on, you can unmute and let me know your thoughts. Let us know your thoughts. Emotions and coaching. It's not a test. Okay, let me do this because there, obviously you've got to warm up the, <laughs> the session today. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite you to consider that this is a safe space and we are here as a family of like-minded individuals, if I can say, the common values, all heart, here to serve, help, and grow. And so there should be no fear of us exploring, even if we don't have a wrong or right answer. And I'm afraid to use the terms wrong and right. I would say maybe what's right for me so far and what we can reflect upon. So there we go, Rima starting. Rima, go ahead, your thoughts, please. Okay, uh, when talking about emotional intelligence, it's about uh, self-awareness and social awareness. Uh, when coaching, uh, the self-awareness is very important for, uh, for the coach and the coachee. And the social awareness is important for the coachee because uh, that way uh, he will be aware of his emotion, what is good, what is not good, and how to choose the emotion and the trigger uh, for these emotion, if, if these are uh, good emotions or not. So uh, this is, I think, the link between the emotional intelligence when we are, we are aware of our emotion and the social uh, emotion and uh, how to reflect our, our how to help the coachee to be aware also about his emotion. Because at the end, the coachee is 
uh, when when choosing or when finding his uh, way or his uh, solution or his goal. Yeah. So uh, he should be aware or he or she should be aware of his emotion. So uh, I think uh, this is it. Thank you. That's actually a very interesting perspective to consider. And uh, I, I'm sure that um, that I, I will get back to you, Emmanuel, in just one second. I'm sure that when we consider uh, having the ability to have a greater social awareness and a greater emotional awareness, and maybe even emotional regulation or management of our emotions in a healthy way that serves us best, that's definitely going to um, add a lot of value uh, to the individual who is being coached because they chose to be coached. Um, I would like to hear from someone else too. Thank you, Rima. Who else would like to kind of uh, share? And uh, Emmanuel, you were telling me, uh, my, uh, what I can't tell you, is about, okay, so you've written emotional intelligence is about knowing or being aware of your emotions. Okay. So I see that that complements what uh, Rima has been saying, Coach Rima has been telling us. And uh, Asha is saying, being you, knowing you, and understanding you while connecting with others' emotions. So interesting. So there's a lot of internal self-reflection, a lot of uh, self-awareness, a lot of self-understanding. That's beautiful. Who else would like to share? Maybe uh, an expanded perspective of this. Let's keep building on that momentum for a little bit before we get into what I'm gonna talk about. Would any other coach like to, and, and for me, you're all coaches. We're all born coaches. And we just discover that innate ability that's within us to connect with others at a deepest level where it's non-judgmental, loving, caring, supporting, and absolute incredible presence. So I'll shut up. Who else would like to share? Sherry Han, please go ahead. I think your perspective is also gonna be very interesting considering that you are also a psychologist, if I remember, is that correct? Yes. Uh, hi, Joan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I uh, just want to talk about uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, it's uh, about understand, use, or manage uh, our feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it helps us to be more connected to our feeling and make um, uh, stronger uh, relationships in our school, uh, in our work, uh, family, uh, friends. Uh, sometimes people um, have uh, conflicts between uh, themselves and uh, the community, society, or others. Uh, they, uh, when we are aware uh, of our uh, emotions, so we will uh, be more uh, forgivable, uh, 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 live in peace. Mm. So uh, all, most of uh, problems uh, came uh, from uh, the conflict and stress, depression, uh, they uh, could she go to coaches to uh, talk about their problems uh, mm -hmm. in these issues. So uh, coaches uh, help them to be more um, uh, aware of the of their uh, feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, then they uh, live in peace and uh, have a stable decisions uh, and. Um, the behavior will be stable also so uh, they will be um, live uh, they will live in um, better life okay thank you very much for that uh, and I, I really appreciate the effort uh, that you're putting and moving from arabic to english i'm really enjoying that yes i'm uh, egyptian and the talking in english it's so our you're doing a great job. it's not our native uh, language don't worry you're doing wonderful thank you so much sharihan for that i'll move on to doreen Doreen, what would you like to share with us? And just to kind of let the people who just joined uh, know what we're talking about. So today we're focusing on the impact of coaching on the emotional or limbic brain and vice versa within the context of a coaching session, because I want to share with you uh, whatever perspective tools and methodologies that will empower you as a coach to empower the coachee within the context of our emotions, the language of emotion. 
So um, I'm also going to take a look. I've seen uh, being you. Yep. All right. So Doreen, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and share with us your Thank insight. you, John. Uh, it's about uh, understanding the coach's emotions and connecting with, the, with mm. your coach. And it's related to the reptilian and limbic brain, mm -hmm. uh, how you understand uh, his emotions uh, and the way to coach him uh, in order to, to move to the uh, prefrontal cortex brain. Nice. So uh, we're getting a little technical here, which is amazing. And I just want to make sure that everyone has an idea of what that means. So there is a concept of the triune brain, which is three parts generally, which is our reptilian brain here at the bottom, which is, uh, which is pretty much in charge of our survival. Then the limbic system somewhere around the middle, which includes the hypothalamus um, uh, and, and many aspects like the amygdala and so forth. And then we're talking about the front part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is a seat supposedly of logic. Now, usually when we talk about these three brains, and Doreen, thank you so much for your input. If you'd like, you can uh, lower your hand. Um, what tends to happen is sometimes as coaches and coaches, we tend to make a, a very logical mistake of assuming that these three parts are completely disconnected from each other or separate from each other, but in fact, they're not. The brain is very holographic. Everything is intertwined with everything else. And yet on a software level, to some extent, these brains do function a little bit differently. What I'd like to do is kind of step back from the science a little bit and simplify, and then dive into the science to understand what's going on, and then step back out and simplify. Because real connections between a human and a human are always simple. And the simpler and cleaner they are, the more real they tend to be, it seems. Of course, if you have a different opinion, that's completely okay, and you can share that with me. So allow me to illustrate um, some of these ideas through a series of questions. And if you don't mind, I'd like to invite you into a breakout room for a very short session, just two to three minutes, really, let's call it a laser session, where uh, you as coaches can have a quick conversation. And like um, Dr. Harris and other great coaches like to say, and kind of bottom line, what it really means to coach someone and how we deal with coaching them when they are going through a certain emotional state. Because what I've recognized as a coach trainer, having been in the training industry for almost 20 years, is that a lot of times when we're working with trainees or we're working with coaches who are becoming coaches, so as in their trainees in that context, emotions can play a very big part in either serving and empowering and enhancing our ability to learn and the, the function of learning really comes from awareness, right? Increasing awareness and understanding and perspective. And emotions can also play a very big role in being a barrier to us learning and raising awareness and understanding. So I've noticed many times that a lot of coaches are so passionate about following models like the A4 model, the GROW model, Oscar model, laser model, so forth, and so, so many. We have so many models, which are incredible. At the expense of understanding the state, in an Arabic, we say hale, just to make sure that we have a, a, a diverse understanding, okay? The state that we're in, both emotionally, mentally, and physically. So how is the coachee showing up to the session? Many times in, in our programs, as we learn and we, we move from ACC to PCC to MCC, we ask ourselves, and we focus very much on the idea of us as coaches being in a state of awareness. It's one of ICF's competencies, how we show up to the coaching experience. What kind of connection do we offer the coachee within that moment? How are we perceiving how are we relating to? What kind of space are we creating between us and the coachee? What little details are we paying attention to where the meaning is, you know, twined into the context of what that coachee is communicating, male or female? Because I just think of all coaches as a neutral person because I look at their soul. I'm interested in understanding their thought process. I'm interested in understanding their reality, their map. And so for me, it's irrelevant if it's a his or her. It's more relevant to understand what they want. 
And so from this perspective, as we think about that, have you ever as coaches started off a coaching session where you felt that your coachee was ready for coaching and discovered quite quickly within the first 30 seconds to a minute that they actually weren't? And you started facing some resistance because as you were trying to ask them to become aware of what they wanted to do so that you could create a solid agreement, it became hard for them to do that. They just weren't being able to tap in to their center of awareness and understanding like they're usually used to. So what's going on there? How do we deal with a situation like this without stepping into the zone where we become dominant? Because we have to be equal at all times with the coachee, right? To, to build the deepest level of trust in order to move forward in parallel, coaches never move into a dominant position. And so if I step into a dominant position, say, John, talking to myself as a coachee, I'd like to invite you to relax. Take a deep breath now. Do this exercise. This is going to help you relax. You've taken control. And then if you're passive, you also face a challenge. Because if you lay back and you just give them too much space, maybe they don't want to shift out of the comfort zone they're in. And sometimes pain and emotions, even if they are a barrier, are a box people are comfortable staying in. So it can be a trap. So I'd like to invite you into a breakout room. I'm going to create them right now. Give me a few seconds. There we go. Um, you will be roughly three to four participants in the room. Actually, I'm going to make it two to three. So you have enough time. And I'm really going to challenge you uh, because we are streaming live. And I want to give everyone who's watching live also an opportunity to connect and relate to this. So for those who are watching live on Facebook, for those of you who are watching live on, on YouTube, and for those of you who are currently in the session, I'd like to challenge you to reflect on this together in three minutes. Try to bottom line your communication as coaches. And think about what can we do? This is the question. As coaches, to ensure that our coachee shifts to the most optimal state emotionally in order for us to move forward with a powerful and impactful coaching session from their perspective, of course. Ready? Here we go. Your rooms are open. It is now at 50. So you have till 53. I might extend 30 seconds. Please jump into the rooms. Don't take too much time. And let's discover and reflect on this because I think it's going to serve you greatly. Um, if you haven't discovered this, and if you have, then you have the ability to serve others greatly too. For those who are watching on Facebook right now, live as we stream, we're going to jump into this experience for just three minutes. So feel free to grab a coffee um, and maybe grab a pen and paper and write down your thoughts as you're thinking about this too, if this is valid for you and reflect on this. What can you do as a coachee, as a coach, to you know, enhance your coachee's capacity to tap into their most resourceful state, targeting their emotions? And if you're the coachee and you've ever been coached, have you ever recognized that sometimes you step into the coaching experience, but you're either nervous or uncomfortable or stressed out or tired or uh, exhausted or concerned or confused? Right? These are all emotions and side effects of emotions. So I'll give you two minutes with your permission and we'll be back. I'm gonna turn off my cam and for two minutes, we'll give everyone an opportunity to reflect and we'll be back to discuss this. Here we go.
All right, so we finished our three minutes. Uh, we've now given uh, 60 seconds for everyone to come back just to give them an opportunity to kind of wrap up their conversations before they come back. Let me stop sharing very quickly and we're moving back to the primary session. For those of you who are watching us live on Facebook right now, uh, again, I wanna say uh, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And as we wait for everyone to come back from the rooms, we will continue our conversation. Welcome, welcome, or well, welcome back. All right, I think it'll just be a matter of 13 seconds that everybody comes back. Two, one, here we go. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for coming back. I appreciate your uh, patience with me. So just to ask you, I know it's very, very short time, and there's a reason for that. So what thoughts, uh, reflections can you share with us in a bottom line way? So let's try to summarize them and give really valuable content for everyone that's watching and for all members of this group. Who would like to start? And again, no pressure. Some thoughts, reflections. Yep, Doreen, go ahead. Um, we were talking about uh, the the reflection is about uh, changing the state of the of the coachee by uh, change their physiology, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, using breathing techniques, some breathing techniques or some exercises or counting down. Wonderful. Yeah. What I'd like to find out is, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a bit, can I invite you, Doreen, and, and anyone who's written that in the group to write it on the chat so it's available for everyone? So you could say, sure. for example, um, shifting someone into a resourceful state and managing their emotions by doing a physical activity or a physiological activity like breathing. Okay, great. Um, who else would like to share? Don't be shy. It's a safe space, unconditional positive regard. Just raise that hand, unmute the mic, and just go for it. Trust me, whatever you have to say is going to be valuable for us all, including me. Some quiet people here. You can you can write in the chat too. Come on, people. Are you going to ask me to do all the talking all day long? Trust me, I talk too much as a living. Yes, Rindala, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom and go for yeah. it. Thank so, you. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's okay. Please go ahead. So in our room, we talked about reassuring the, the coachee that it's a safe uh, space, that we're holding for them a safe space. Hmm. And uh, they are the master of their sessions and to acknowledge their emotions as well. And asking them a question that will help them shift uh their attention by trigger, triggering their logical brain wonderful and we will help them uh, like uh, shift focus from uh, the the problem they uh, are stuck in mm -hmm. to uh, to finding uh, start fighting finding a solution that's incredible thank you so much for sharing that so what we notice here again is um using questions is a powerful tool and using the sense of safety. So kind of quieting down the reptilian brain and letting people know that they are in a safe space. And so they can permit themselves to become more at ease, to relax and to kind of let go. Okay, that's wonderful. Could you also write that down in the chat if you don't mind, just very summarized. I just like would like to keep that in the chat. Who else would like to share? And, and just before you start, I'm going to jump over and open up the window a little bit to let some, some uh, cool air in. I tend to overheat all the time. Give me one second. All right, because I get very excited when I do these sessions. <laughs> OK, what else? OK, so good yes. evening, good morning, good afternoon. Hi. I, this is Anubha from India. 
So I and Jackie uh, shared the breakout room together and we respected that we both do corporate uh, coaching. Mm. And mostly we have observed in the corporates, most, uh, you know, the people, the coachee comes with the task orientation rather than the relationship orientation. So yes. there the emotional bent has not been seen. But some coachee, we find that they don't open up and they are in their own cocoon, they are in their own uh, zone and they don't open up. So we just thought that uh, what we do is usually probably we put our story to them. And we give them the comfort that they are in a right zone. So this is what we mm. discussed. That's such a valuable input. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because from the perspective of uh, corporate coaching and business coaching and even executive coaching, sometimes we tend to uh, feel that there isn't much of a reason from a coachee's perspective for them to really address emotions because they tend to be more task oriented or process oriented or project oriented or objective oriented or whatever it is. But in retrospect, let's think about this for a few seconds. If you don't mind me kind of suggesting something, where does motivation come from? Or let's call it drive. Could you just repeat this question? Yes, of course. Where would you say motivation comes from or drive? So if we're, if I, and allow me, please, please correct me because I don't want to be making assumptions. Within the context of business coaching and corporate coaching, as you're coaching your coachees, what's usually the, the general agreement or the scope of the general agreement? What tends to show up a lot? So an objective, getting towards a yes. certain outcome. So basically, it's mostly into the objective, the mm -hmm. strategic goal or the, you know, the sometimes the mission and sometimes uh, going very strategic alignment uh, yeah. or maybe even sometimes performance oriented so this is absolutely where we've observed. Yeah. so we've got kpis we've got performance we've got absolutely. results we've got um maybe uh, a wide vision of thinking seeing the big picture and then looking at the tiny details because that's what a mission vision is it's a big picture of something we are driven to do right right so so if if i asked you right now if I gave you a car and that car was a very uh, low, um, let's say fuel consumption car, like a very uh, simple car, like a hybrid car, let's say a Toyota Prius, okay? Not a lot of power in the engine, but very great, very good mileage. And I asked you to achieve those objectives and goals. If it was a, a relaxed environment and you were moving forward at a regular pace, you would definitely achieve those goals because you have a nice car that's taking you at a good pace, it's consistent and it's affordable and the fuel consumption is great. And that's how many times we perform within a corporate environment when we have a stable business and we're just trying to move up to the next level of performance, build deeper trust and growth with our current clients and target market, et cetera. But what about conditions and situations when you've got high stress environments like we, we passed through the last two years with COVID, and a dynamic shift in the market, even for us as coaches. And you'll notice that sometimes people come to you and they're solving very complex problems or they're uncomfortable with the idea of going back to work face-to-face -face, or even uncomfortable with the idea of having remained working from home or digital or whatsoever. So within these contexts, sometimes we need a faster car, like a, like a I don't know, a, like a M3 or M4 BMW or a Ferrari or something. So my question is, what is the fuel that keeps driving people to move forward, whether it is a Toyota Prius or whether it's a Ferrari within the context of work. What is the fuel and where does it come from? Any ideas? Can we say that it's their emotions of uh, like uh, uh, being happy, satisfied, fulfilled? They mm. want... Uh... Would you, can anger do that? Like if you met someone in the company and they really irritated you and you felt that they were a competition and you just wanted to show them, can anger also drive you forward? Of course. Competition? Revenge. <laughs> Not a violent <laughs> revenge. But what I'm trying to say is emotions play an integral role in pretty much everything that we do. And even within the context of business, one of the main reasons why business coaching, corporate coaching can sometimes hit a wall when dealing with clients 
is because as we are coaching them and we set wonderful objectives and in the coaching environment, for example, Anuba and um, uh, Jackie, they feel very safe with you. So when they set these objectives and these ideas, they're in a very resourceful state. I hope that's correct. Is that correct? Or at least close to, to reality? Yep. Okay. Have you faced any challenges with them? For example, after you have a fantastic coaching session, they will come back to you and you'll find that when they try to apply their objectives or ideas or thoughts, it wasn't as easy as it seemed in the coaching session. I'm just curious, and this has no reflection on your coaching capacity. I'm just trying to highlight a different perspective for everybody here because it's so lovely to have the ability to look at it also from a business coaching perspective. Uh, indeed, it has happened a lot of times uh, yeah. recently when we were doing a project of 560 hours of coaching, we had great sets of examples here. So I can actually relate the question which you just thrown to us. So yeah, it has happened. Thank you so much uh, for, for allowing us the opportunity to peer into the challenges of more technical coaching when it comes to corporate business and even um, let's say serious um, types of careers. And this is again where emotion kicks in and where knowing and understanding how to process emotion is absolutely essential. And I would say an art form for the coach. So let's take a look. We've got some responses here. We've got pain and pleasure from Sarah. Absolutely. So the brain, the brain is always running away from pain or the perspective of pain and moving towards pleasure or whatever it believes is pleasurable. And so if we have a long-term goal, or if we have a long-term objective, whether that objective or goal is personal, so if we're doing life coaching, or it's career-oriented, if we're doing career coaching, if it's family-oriented, so if we're doing family coaching, or if it's relationship-oriented, if we're doing relationship coaching, or business or corporate-oriented or executive, all forms of coaching are really driven to work to assist and empower others to expand their awareness find creative new ways to see things, and that ultimately should, to some extent, drive them to take action so that their behaviors can change, their habits can change, and the reality can change. I would like to share my screen really quickly and kind of uh, highlight this. And I'm looking down because I have another computer that I'm using right now to uh, be able to draw for you until I get set up in my new home. So. This is a little bit what it looks like in some aspects. When we are dealing with the brain, and as we've said before, uh, some of you have seen me draw this image. This is a really hor horrible, this looks more like a bean, but anyways, you've got the reptilian brain here at the bottom, and that's the brain more or less responsible for our survival, right? So survival, okay? And then many times scientists kind of draw the limbic brain, which is in charge of emotions, somewhere around here, and they call it limbic and emotions. And then many times we kind of super simplify and say that here is the prefrontal, which is the seat of logic, even though technically it's much larger, okay? Now in many aspects, what tends to happen is as we step into a coaching experience and our coachee sits down with us and we're about to start our conversation. And especially if we had a fantastic coaching session before, you're surprised to find that the coachee is not as open, as communicative, as cooperative, and as easy to deal with as they were in previous sessions. Or sometimes we feel like they're just off. They're just something not okay with the situation. And one of the things that I've noticed that tends to most, uh, mostly displace a coach's sense of certainty is when the coachee is angry, okay? So what you'll notice is that the coachee steps into the coaching experience and you ask them a question and they talk to you from a place of very deep pain. And usually surrounding that deep pain, the topic is some anger some guilt, maybe some fear, uh, maybe a sense of 
uh, lack of, let me move this, uh, fairness. So they don't feel things are fair. Um, if you've seen David Rock's model of SCARF, which is one of my favorite, um, a lack of autonomy, the ability for them to make their own decisions, a lack of relatedness, like he says, which is not feeling comfortable with the environment they're in or the people they're interacting with. Maybe they don't feel they don't belong or that they're not appreciated or cared for or loved or respected or whatever it is. Okay, you've got uh, maybe a sense of certainty. And so people need that sometimes to feel that they understand what's going to happen in the future, whether in the near future or in the distant future, what, how is it going to affect their reality in general? Are they going to be able to deal with the challenges that are, are going to happen or come their way? Uh, will they have the power and ability to do that? Can they trust themselves in this situation? to be able to deal with that situation as best as possible. Absolutely, Sherihan, yes. Uh, stress, disappointing, exactly. You've got also maybe sometimes, so we said autonomy, relatedness, fairness, uh, certainty, and pretty much uh, a lot more things like this. So what happens in the state? Anytime we get a sense that we're not in control of our environment, Anytime we get a sense that people are treating us with some, let's say, dominance, right? And it almost makes us feel like we are less than they are, or we believe that that's the way we're being treated. Anytime we are sh our, our, our environment is shook, and sometimes I like to call these pillars. So you've got these pillars on which the building is built, the really old buildings, right? So you have here the, the roof and here the bottom, which is the base and foundation. And these pillars can be family. It looks kind of like the wheel of life. They can be work, they can be health, etc. So it doesn't always mean that the challenge that's shaking a person's emotional stability is necessarily an internal challenge, a psychological one based at the level of their software but it can sometimes be an external one. So this is more, let's say, an internal understanding. And this is more of an external stimuli. And what that means is, let's say you're the coachy, you're pretty happy, everything's going great, you're excited to go to your session with uh, Anuba, or I hope I pronounced your name properly, or um, let's say Rindala or any other coach. And on your way there, as you're waiting in traffic, someone just rear ends you, just slams into your car, you're shook, your neck snaps, you're in pain, you get angry, suddenly your heart's beating very fast. You, you, know, you snap out of this calm, relaxed state that you're going into, you get out of the car and you're just checking on the person because you're empathetic, you're caring. And suddenly that person starts shouting at you and blaming you, even though they're the people who, who crashed into you and they were on their phone, and you, you break into a big fight. Uh, once you're done, you get in your car, you arrive to wherever you are to have your coaching session. As you're getting out of the car, the rear bumper just drops to the floor. And now you're stuck in a situation where the rear bumper is on the ground. You have to pick it up. You're going to get your hands dirty, and you're about to go in a coaching session. What kind of emotional, mental, psychological, physical state is that coachee going to have and be in when they are showing up to you, the coaching experience? Would you say they are ready to be coached? I would really love some responses. I'd like oh, to hear from no, some people. Definitely not. No, right? For the rest of you, please feel free to, 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 to write and chat. So definitely not. Let's not take it that far. Let's say um, some, of, some of us here are Lebanese and in Lebanon, I don't know if you've been following up in the news, but we've had two years of some very, very, very difficult challenges from the August 4th explosion. And consistently now uh, with the crisis that's happening, economic and social in Lebanon, as in other countries, um, 
Sherry Han, sure, I'll repeat the question in a second. You will notice that people are having um, these little problems, but on a daily basis, which is slowly eating away at their sense of certainty, right? So if you live in a country right now that's being plagued by COVID, for example, India went through a very difficult time and still is, but much, much worse, let's say uh, about six, seven months ago with the Delta variant uh, going crazy in the country, other countries in Europe have faced similar challenges in the US, the same. So what you've noticed is with all these changes fundamentally that are happening, people can be affected by an instant problem like a car crash before coming into the session or the, a conversation with the wife or husband or a, a problem at school or work, losing your job, losing an account or a long-term problem, which is slowly stressing us out as time goes by and we're still not finding a good solution. The short term is quite easy to manage. The long term tends to be much harder because the long term can slowly degrade people's state of mind. And you, the coachee arrives to the session very much at the, the, the stepping stone, the fence between where they could use therapy and you can still coach them. And I think this can be very confusing for coaches sometimes. So what I'd like to do is highlight just something small. When we're dealing with the emotional brain and when we're dealing with people's emotions, sometimes it's not enough to let them know that they are in a safe space. So one of the tools that you recommended was to invite them to do a breathing technique. Other tools were to have a conversation and remind them that they can turn off everything that's happening outside of themselves and maybe step into the coaching session in a resourceful state. What if the coachee couldn't? What if they wanted to? And they're trying to step into a resourceful state or shift into a resourceful state or melt into a resourceful state, but they're not being able to. What kind of emotions could arise for them? Frustration. Absolutely. What else? Anger. Right. What else? Sadness. Helplessness, right? Because they're not able to, they know that they have to, but they they just can't. Mm. And guilt. And guilt, yes. Guilty towards you. I can't tell you how many times I've built fantastic relationships with coaches. And um, we've really respected and honored each other and honored each other's time. And many times they step into the session and you feel like they're, they're having a challenge of shifting into a resourceful state and then they are frustrated. They get into a cyclical loop where they want to have answers, but they're angry at themselves for not having answers and it becomes quite judgmental. There's this internal dialogue that kicks in in their mind. And if you've taken transactional analysis, you'll notice that the inner child and the parent come in and they start hearing these voices talking to themselves about what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And all this is happening is a lot of noise, which is disconnecting them from their connection with themselves and their connection with you. And so over the last three to four months, I've gotten a lot of uh, communication from our uh, coach students and, and many other coaches telling me, how do you deal with a situation like this? And this is why I wanted to uh, create this conversation, this session, to kind of elaborate uh, on the methods that we can do or use to work with these coaches and these uh, sensitive and critical times for them. Because if you can work with them during those times, pretty much everything else becomes smooth sailing. Because when they're resourceful, they're resourceful. So let's take a look. Emmanuel, thank you. You said you need to observe the psychological state of the client before start of the session and therefore create the necessary balance. Great. This is exactly what I'm looking for. We all know what we need to do. The question is, how do you do it in a way that maintains the integrity of the coachee and their sense of absolute certainty that they can because if you talk to them about accomplishing great things that they've set as an agreement and they can't even manage their emotional state right now to be focused with you, don't you think their brain is going to create a conflict? They won't believe themselves. 
So even when they say something that's right, emotionally, they're not sensing it. And then there isn't that connection where people will be driven to do what they told, they said they could do. So for example, if I was coaching Rindala right now, and I'm having a conversation with Rindala and Rindala is stressed out. And just like Emmanuel was saying, I noticed that she's in a unresourceful psychological state for her, based on what I've recognized so far. And we had this conversation. I said, Rindala, hey, how are you? I, I get the sense that um, you, you're a little more tense than usual. Is that correct? Can you tell me, would you mind sharing with me what's going on? With the sincerest intention, of course, assuming that we've built that level of openness, candor, and respect. And in this case, Rindala might step in and say, well, you know, uh, it's been a tough day, or it's been a tough month, or it's been a tough year. Or just today, you know, John, usually I'm happy, but I'm just not feeling it today. John? Yes. Can I share one example here? Exactly yeah. the same thing happened. So the way you were communicating right now with Rindala. So, uh, you know, with me, it was my second session with the coachy, and I exactly said the same thing. So I don't see you in a stride, what has happened. He just told me one thing that, ma'am, I lost my both parents, mom and dad a week back because of COVID. Oh my God, I can't tell you. I could relate everything, whatever you have said right now. So it was pretty tough, but then yes, it was. It turned out to be a very good coaching session. He introspected, he understood. And I can actually relate this element of what you mentioned right now, you know, which is pain to pleasure. So it's all in our hands. So thank you so much for that. It's my pleasure. It is, it is all in our hand because and here's a, a simple example to illustrate this. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, a dear, dear friend of mine from university, I mean, we've known each other for 25 years. Um, he had lost his mother and his father over a period of a year. And now he only had his grandmother. And he's, in, he's, he's my age, he's around 40, he has two children, he's married, has a lovely wife, beautiful family, but he's very connected to family. And his grandmother is the last connection to the elders of his family. There's no one left then he becomes the elder. And so um, we were having a conversation and he was telling me, you know, my grandma's not doing very well. And I said, you know, I, I wish her all the health and I wish she, she, she gets better. I left and the next morning, uh, I got a message from him, text saying, uh, unfortunately she's passed. What do people tend to do usually in this case? Like, in a full, you know, this depends, of course, on the culture and the, the countries we come from. There's many different practices. But in general, if you would say, what's the first thing relatives and people close to others who don't always see them tend to do? What's the first question they ask? Or at least in the first two, three questions they ask. Any ideas? You mean their relatives, uh, John, or are yeah. we as coaches? No, not as coaches. General people. What's the first thing they ask? How did she die? Yeah. They're like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. In an attempt to empathize, right? What happened? As coaches, we understand that when we ask questions, we direct focus. And by directing focus, then we're actually asking the brain to focus on a specific memory. So if every time I walked up to this person, I said, hey, I'm so sorry about that. What happened? What am I asking their brain to do? To relive that memory, yes or no? They're replaying that memory or parts of it in order to express to me. Well, if you're trying to decrease someone's pain and you're asking them to relive the memory 50 times, as everyone is telling them the same day, I hope everything's okay. And they keep repeating that story to themselves 50 times. And they repeat it with emotion because it's emotionally charged. What do you think we're actually doing to that person's reality? Are we serving them or hurting them? We're hurting. hurting. Focus on the pain. Absolutely. So here's an interesting thing. What do coaches do in general? Because we might face that with our client 20 times a week. We might have a week in which 10 clients are having challenges. Apart from protecting myself as a coach, I have to have a tactical way to deal with this that is healthy for me 
and healthy for others, especially when you build strong, meaningful relationships with your coachees because you're partnering with them. That's like marriage. And it is a very interesting one. You get married during the coaching session and then you disconnect. And I'm talking here about purely the essence of being truly present. And so in this perspective, many times we might say to the coachee, hey, I've noticed you're, you're not yourself. Are you comfortable going forward with this coaching session right now? Would you like to tell me what's going on? Do you feel like sharing? Remember, this is a safe space. Unconditional positive regard. This is what I have for you. I truly believe in everything that you're capable of doing. I just, I just get a sense in my heart. I've just, I felt that um, you're not yourself. And you lay back and you just become quiet. Many times what you'll notice is when you say you're not yourself, you're not really attacking that individual. You're just showing an observation and you're asking for them to let you know if that's correct or not. So it's a kind and gentle invite to allow that person to share their thoughts with you. You see, because people let go of emotional charge in several different ways. So yes, you can invite people to do a breathing exercise and it's fantastic. But do you think it applies to this context? So if my friend wanted me to coach them and their grandmother had just passed away and they were feeling very upset and they just wanted to, to have a session in which they could process their emotions prior to uh, going back and dealing with their children and the family and everything else. And that was the agreement they wanted. If I said to this person, hi, okay, I've noticed you're on yourself. Let's do some breathing. Let's just do some relaxation exercises. <laughs> I'm, I'm making this silly a little bit, but I just want to point out, do you think it would work? No, because oh. uh, the emotions are very high and he's uh, sometimes very angry or very sad. Hmm. Excellent. So I'm going to share with you. Uh, is this interesting for everybody? A lot of people are quiet. I'm not used to that. If it is interesting to you, please give me thumbs up on Zoom. I just want to make sure that we're still on the same page. Uh, Joseph, thank you for that. Just want to check with everyone. Claudia, oh, yes. Okay. But you're very, very quiet. And I, <laughs> I need to sense you. Jackie, okay. Um, just making sure everybody else is okay with this. I mean, you're still here, so that's good news. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me share with you a couple of tactics that you could use, um, at least that I've, I've used, that have been very, very helpful for me. And hopefully they will serve you well and serve your clients well, because we really care about them. And maneuvering this very, very sensitive uh, environment requires a lot of wisdom and understanding and also some, some competency. So let's take a look at this really quickly. Now, if you remember in the reptilian brain, for, for those of you who have taken uh, training on um, uh, neurointegrative coaching with me before, we've got three responses. We've got fear, okay, which is uh, turned into a flight response, which means I'm running away from or trying to avoid a situation. We've got the fight response, which means I become aggressive Okay, I become the aggressor, so aggressive. Here, the fight is switched into anxiety and a need to escape. And then we've got the freeze response, which is feeling overwhelmed and maybe uh, submitting to the situation or reality or maybe giving up, or maybe trying to uh, use humor to shift the energy and kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of, it's kind of hard to, uh, to put it in context, but it's sort of like trying to make the other person who's about to aggress me uh, feel like they like me so they won't hurt me anymore. So if you see a, a person walking the street and then a bunch of bullies, he tries to joke with them, be their friends, so they don't want to hurt them anymore. So we use humor in that context. 
And so if I'm working with a coachee and they're in a state of deep stress, pain, trouble, anxiety, and their emotions are really triggered, and I want to invite them to feel more centered, to tap into their strength, to their sense of certainty, which is in the prefrontal, okay? These are some things that I could do. And so when it comes to the flight response, people tend to feel anxiety. Why do they feel anxious? Because they feel sometimes that the situation goes far beyond their capability and they don't want to deal with it. And so they feel stuck. So let's say you walk into a room and now suddenly you're faced with someone that you don't like to talk to or you really don't want to deal with or you're uncomfortable dealing with. You're going to feel a sense of stuckness and that will create some anxiety for you. And so within context, many times when I sit down with clients and I feel that they are in that emotionally charged state where they're not feeling themselves, I will try to get a better understanding. So one of the reasons why I say, hi, I kind of noticed that something's different today. So I don't always, I don't always say things like, uh, I've noticed that you're, you're um, angry right now, or I'll just say, I've noticed that something's different today. What's going on? And what will happen is they will tell me most times what emotion they're feeling. So it'll be under a dialogue like this. They'll say, I'm so angry today. I just want to kill my boss. Of course, they don't mean it, but within that context. Or they'll say, uh, John, I just have so much on my plate right now. I, I don't know. Usually I'm feeling comfortable, but today's just not my day. And I'll be like, what do you mean? Can you tell me a little bit more? And they'll say, you know, today, I just, uh, I feel like this is too much. This is too much to handle. I, I just, I wish I could take a break. I'm sorry, I'm going over an hour. I know, I, I promise I'll be done in five minutes. And then someone else will say, for example, you know what, John, uh, I can't even, I don't even know where to begin to tell you what's going on in my life. I, I, I wish that this would all just end. Now, in some aspects, you know, people will look at this and say, oh my God, they need therapy. No, slow down. This isn't necessarily, people can express their emotional state with many, uh, uh, let's say descriptive words, but it doesn't actually mean that they are depressed or in a state of medical anxiety, okay? So we can feel anxious for a short period of time or so forth. So in this situation, I'm searching to understand which of these three in responses to threat am I dealing with? So if it's a fight response, that means that that person is sensing the need to release a lot of energy to fight back at whatever is their source of pain, whether it's in their mind or outside of themselves. I hope I, this is clear. If it's the flight response, it means that person can't figure out how to get out of the situation they're in. So their awareness and reality is blocked. They feel like they're in a trap. And if it's the, the uh, freeze response, then that person has lost their sense of certainty that they can and have the resources and capacity to deal with the current challenge and future challenges. So some language to make this easy. In this situation, I might say something like, and I hope this could be of value to you. If it's the flight response, the first thing I do is I, I give them options. And when I say I give them options, I don't actually tell them what the options are, but I invite them to discover options. So I say things like, okay, what's going on? I say, oh my God, John, I, I just can't deal with this anymore. It's driving me crazy. I, I don't wanna be at work anymore. I'll be, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And he'd be like, well, you know, I, I feel like I wanna kill my boss, but if I leave my job, I'm gonna lose my job and, and I can't leave the job because I need the job to make the money, to take care of my family and there's just no other options and no one's hiring out there. You see the story? And so you can see how tense they are today about their job. Now, in this situation, would you say this is flight, fight or freeze? I'm hoping I hear from you. I'm gonna open up the chat. Fight, flight or freeze? Flight, perfect. Okay. So we got to give them options. So I'd say here in this situation, I'd say, okay, I understand. So let me repeat back to you what you just said to me. See the mirror? And I will say, so what I understood from you is right now you're so fed up. You'd love to leave your job, but you can't because you have responsibilities. Your boss is causing you a problem or is a source of pain that you have. And at this stage, you feel kind of like you don't have choices or options, which are what they said to me. And they'll be like, yes, that's exactly it. So then I know we've connected. What happens here? By addressing and saying back to them what is hurting them through their own language, 
instantly the reptilian brain shuts off and they shift to a more resourceful state, not completely, but partially because they feel heard. They feel understood. They feel like someone has gotten them. And so suddenly their world is not made of one person, which is them, but now of two. And the coach is now invited into the space of pain of the coachee. And you can now work together to figure out how to deal with that awareness. I hope this is interesting. If it is, feel free to give me a visual, at least, or try to type it. From there, when I share this with them, and I say, well, would it be okay for us before we start our coaching session to kind of discover and, and maybe explore that a little bit, just a little bit. And the reason why I do that is if I spend five minutes invested in exploring with the client their pain, many times we end up at an agreement before the coaching session even starts. So I don't start my coaching session personally before I work with the client to shift them into a resourceful state. Now, some of you might tell me, well, John, yeah, but that's just not very financially intelligent because at the end of the day, you're giving them more time than you initially invested. Well, here's the thing. I like to invest in my clients because when you build that connection in that area of pain, guess what? You can always go to that level of depth with them at any point in time because in their mind, subconsciously, you and them have both achieved an okay. You have a green ticket to the deepest most painful space of their brain and in their mind and their heart. So the next time you're having a coaching session and they're off, you can say, hey, I have noticed you're a little bit not yourself. What's going on? And he, they will, they're trained now. They've kind of understood how to communicate to you and say, well, okay, well, here's a story. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. I know I should not be dealing with this. So there's a level of awareness that's being built, but the situation is done. I say, okay, would you like to tackle that now? Or would you like to work on our initial agreement? And they'll say, no, no, let's work on our initial agreement. So what has happened is you have empowered your coachee to be able to compartmentalize and separate challenges from the coaching session. The coaching session has become of the greatest value for them because now through reoccurring practice, they know that when they're in a coaching session, they are able to shut off everything that's going outside and focus purely on themselves and work with you towards fruitful solutions. Does that make sense? Remember, it's not about one session at a time. It's about the long-term relationship you're building with your clients. At the same point in time, if it's the fight response, there's a lot of anger. So a lot of times I'll tell them, well, what's going on? Just for fun, if you could do what you wanted to do right now, what you're feeling inside of you, what would that look like? What would that feel like? What would that sound like if we want to use NLP? What would you do? Let's just have some fun. You got two minutes. Turn it into whatever movie you like. Tell me the story here. What's going on? And he'd be like, me? I would ramble. I would take. I would shoot. I would destroy. I would kill. I would explode. I would whatever. They're releasing their anger. Sometimes it takes them five minutes to release. Sometimes it takes two minutes to release. Once they vent, guess what? The reptilian brain has released all the pressure, automatically you'll see, they take a deep breath or they laugh and they look at you and they're like, okay, I'm always so dramatical. And I'll be like, well, okay, how do you feel? And then suddenly they recognize that their feeling has changed. And they'll be like, oh, I feel much better. And I'm like, okay, what would you like to do? Would you like to start our coaching session? And many times they're shocked. They're like, we haven't started yet? I'm like, no, I didn't feel it was fair for us to start right now. I wanted to ensure that you came to the coaching session in a resourceful state. You have no idea how much they appreciate that because we're being human. It's okay. We shift things five minutes to ensure that we connect with people and deal with them because people, they're spirits. And when they leave your coaching session changed, guess what? a lot less harm is going to be done to everyone around them in their environment. We are all interconnected. The third one, freeze. When they feel that they cannot deal with whatever is going on and you can sense that sense of giving up. So many times I just 
I'm just there for them. I'm present. And I say, well, what's going on? They say, well, John, I, uh, I just, I give up. I really give up. I, I just can't do this anymore. It's, uh, it's too much for me. I can't handle this. And so I'll, I'll be a little quiet and then I'll use one of two ways. I can either use humor. And so sometimes I will shock them and this is called a uh, pattern interrupt in NLP. So I'll say, okay. And they're used to me being serious. I'll say, I, I give up too. And their brain wasn't prepared for that. So <laughs> it's almost like a shock to their system. And so they're like, what? And I'll be like, well, I mean, if you give up, we're, I'm a coach and we're partners in the coaching session experience. No, I give up too. Let's give up together. And a lot of times you just see them laugh. And they're like, what do you mean? Come on, seriously, John, be serious with me. I need answers right now. I'm like, okay, we can get to answers, but I have a question for you. Would you say that the way you're currently feeling is going to allow you and empower us both to achieve those answers you desire? And they'd say, no. And I say, okay, how would you like to be feeling right now so we can have the best and most amazing coaching session that's going to serve you right now? Being realistic. And like, well, you know, I need to calm down. I'll be like, okay, so what could you do to calm down? What would you like to do? Or maybe what has worked for you before that has given you the ability to calm down? Maybe like, well, just give me five minutes. I just want to walk or let me go get my coffee or okay, I, I like to do this dance or I just want to listen to the song. So people do have their strategies. If you give them an opportunity to feel okay to use them, you'll shift them into a state of possibility versus a state of no possibility. And that's where the dialogue can start. So the A4 model, the GROW model, the CLEAR model, the OSCAR model, these models are there to serve you both, to create structure so we have some kind of a process and a journey. But ultimately, it's our human connection that invites us to be real. And the honesty that we share with others and they share with us allows us to create an environment that is far richer and more capable of creative you know, design than uh, being in a state of just let's do our coaching session because we agreed to it and the client steps into it feeling guilty because they've already paid for it. They don't want to lose the money. So there's a state of pain, which increases their desire to be in the reptilian brain. So they feel even more pressured. That's never going to work. You will never get to a solid agreement. Forgive the word never, you could, but it won't stick because that person is doing it more out of an automatic behavior, subconscious autopilot versus being truly present with you. And that's so exhausting for you. So protect yourself and protect your clients. And just recognize emotions are the greatest gift and the worst whip or tool. And we've got to learn how to flip that side. Okay, I took a lot of your time. Thank you for the amazing session. Sorry, I need to exit. Absolutely. Thank you. That was excellent. My pleasure. Hi, John. I must say this is a great session. Thanks for this present. My absolute pleasure. Need more of these sessions with you, John. Thank you, John. It's my absolute pleasure. My objective and our objective at CTA is always to serve you. I learn with you as much as you learn with me or even more. Because when we hear about your pain as coaches, remember you're our client, right? And then we understand how best to serve you or you send us on a mission to find more effective and intelligent ways to achieve greater outcomes. And ultimately this is all pouring back into the lives of our coaches which makes it a sustainable business for you and also a, uh, a human mission where we change the world, not just through what we do, but through the impact of our love and our work for others. And that always propagates into the world around us. So be brave and, and, and try, experiment. Thank you so much, guys. I wish you a beautiful day. I took a lot of time for those watching on Facebook. Thank you for staying with us for this live. For those watching this on YouTube as a 
recorded session. I hope you found this to be valuable. You can always reach out to any one of us from CTA. We're here to serve you. For all your beautiful coaches, you are our wealth and inspiration. Please feel free to always reach out to us with topics you want and ideas that you have, and we're here to serve you. Thank you so much for allowing me the grace of changing the scheduling for the session. I put you through so much trouble. It won't happen again. Wish you a beautiful day. God bless you. Take care. Thank and see you. you in the near future. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, by the way, to Nick and everyone at CTA and Soham who are always supporting us. By the way, I keep forgetting, but these are the people who work very hard in the background to make sure that our lives are easy and organized. So great thanks to them too. Bye-bye, everyone. God bless you. Take care.